नमस्ते so i'm hoping that my i am in the light an actor you see love the limelight so my work has mainly been in theater and film and over the years i have endeavored to work with theater and process work and make it available to both children and adults in the course of my work what i have come across is that there are huge uh, things there are great learnings that we can experience from the learner in my case it's been through children and so today i hope to share with you some experiences that i've had with children over the years and from whom i've learned and i hope that it would be of some use to you because these are children from underprivileged backgrounds whose realities aren't always available to us for us to actually take a close look at them we tend to generalize about them so that's what today's talk is about learning from the learner of particular concern has been the fact that student suicides especially in bangalore at least um when i open the paper especially at exam times or result times it's full of news about student suicides and i thought that you know i can't really change the system that most parents subscribe to but what i can do is maybe maybe what we can do is to empower the children to cope with what is expected of them with what is given to them as what will be their reality and become their reality in um, a report published by times of india in december january 2018 it was 8th of jan 2018 it said that students in india are committing suicide at a very fast rate 26 students committed every uh, 24 hours they committed suicide now that that is alarming according to another report which uh, was based on government data which was uh, publicized by ndtv in december 2019 said that 81 children 81 students committed suicide in reputed premier institutes of the country in the last 3 years now something's happening and something's not right i do not have all the answers none of us may ever have all the answers but that can't prevent us from trying and probing and knowing a little more one of the things i've come in touch with over the years through my work in theater for children and theater with children is that there are disparities disparities not only in terms of money and what we have yes there are the haves and there are the have nots but disparities in socio economic backgrounds cultural political histories disparities in abilities disparities in opportunities and i think it is these disparities which shape our lives and also society and if we are to see a fabric of society in which the disparities are lesser then we are going to have to do something about it and that doing is not going to come only with money and funding it's going to come with something intangible that intangible part of ourselves which we are willing to part with which we are willing to impart and share with those who truly need it and so there was this project we began um uh, with government school children and initially it's a theater project we decided to do a play with the children it was aimed at the adults 
in their lives in order to make them sensitive to the fact that they needed to love these children for who they are and not for what they are or what they will become. So to actually value the person, the people that these children were and are. So we started this play. It was uh, based on a North Indian folk tale, a delightful folk tale about a washerman wanting to have his pet donkey turned into a man. And uh, of course, if there's time at the end, I will tell you the story. But for now, what the situation we were in was that we had 25 children who wanted to do and be in the play. And then 15 children turned up, so only 15 in attendance. And we were told that even these 15 are coming only because you promised them meals. But I don't think that was true. Though, coming to think of it, the rate of absenteeism in schools has reduced after the midday meal program. Children are turning up in school. Parents make sure they turn up. And also classroom hunger has been addressed. You know, children would sit chewing on their ties and chewing on their hankies in class. And that's how classroom hunger was detected. So I didn't even know this term existed until some years ago. And yes, it was 2010 when we began this project. And so we started with this bunch of kids who came to us. It was winter some of them with shoes on their feet, some of them without, some of them with sweaters, some of them without. But what all of them had in common was the will, was the will to be part of something different, something new, something they believed in. And so we started off, but nobody wanted to be the hero, the donkey in the play, except one child, Sunil. Uh, the names of the children I use will be changed in order to protect their privacy and identity. So Sunil um, said he wanted to be the donkey. And I said, why do you want to be the donkey? Nobody wants to be the donkey. So he said, no, it's the hero. I said, are you sure? And they also know he's the hero, but they're all saying no. And he said, no, you know, it would be easy for me to do this role because that's what I'm called at home, Katte. Katte in Canada means donkey. While we laughed, it did have black humor to it. And uh, how many of, I mean, most of us know what it feels like, right? To have a nickname that reminds us of our deficiencies or tells us of our inadequacies. And how deeply ingrained such a nickname can get, and how debilitating it can get. So we decided to shape the theatrical experience, the theatrical exercises, the improvisations, in a way that would address the issues of the children. And we started working with an exercise on looking at one's own name. So they would call out to each other and see what that felt like. And we also looked at how the world defines us with a name. What is the meaning we have given to ourselves through that name? Can we redefine ourselves? So these were all the things we looked at. And in the process of that exercise, we were also looking at what is it we need to accept about our realities? What are the realities we need to cope with? What is it we can change? What is it we cannot change? And in the process, we came to know that Sunil was a motherless child. And in the first part of the exercise, when he mentioned it, everybody sat paralyzed. Nobody moved. They just watched him mention and talk about his reality. It was later when we went to the next part of the exercise and we said, okay, how, we can't, what do you tell a motherless child? What words of solace can you provide? Nothing, nothing really. But that day, these children, in the second part of the exercise, they came and sat around him. They watched him, they held his hand, they ran their hands on his back, 
They ran their hands through his hair. Now this was something they'd never done before. That space, that time and space was not available in the classroom. In the structured time and space, there is no room for it. There is no room for sharing vulnerabilities. There is no room for sharing what is taboo. But here were these kids telling Sunil, you have to be brave. I hope there will be someone who will look after you. I hope there will be someone to care for you. And th this, this was the way in, in which they were interacting with him. And then um, one girl said, you know, uh, you have to be uh, brave and when you feel sad, you come to my house. So simple. But this child, it struck her. And so on and so forth. And at one point, the bell rang for lunch. And there was one child who said, listen, here's a safety pin. Pin up your shirt. And he pinned up his shirt and they were gone. And we never saw Sunil sitting alone at lunch thereafter. We didn't see him brooding by himself. He had someone to hold his hand. And it wasn't us, it wasn't figures of authority. It was from his peer group, from his friends, that in which he felt most com comfortable. And similarly, in the case of Kamala, who one day was with a swollen face, and she was very quiet and sat aloof. And when we asked her what the matter was, she said she had had a fall. And when we asked how and where and when, she wasn't able to fake the fall convincingly. And then she admitted the truth. She had an alcoholic parent and she had been beaten. Now, she is not an exception. There are many children who go through this, but I don't see statistics on it. In my research, I could not find statistics to substantiate it. So I share with you her experience. And she sat there talking about her reality. There was no room for her to sh have shared this because it was taboo. It is held with shame and guilt. But that day, what was taboo was shared. And the responses that came from the children were pretty much what they had offered Sunil. So the loss of a parent and a parent who was alcoholic seemed to draw the same sort of responses. But as part of the exercise and we continued, there were dreams that were seen and yet to be seen and which had to be worked on. And there was this little boy called Krishna who uh, we had been told we shouldn't take and uh, include in the play because he would do cartwheels all the time and he would have been the biggest distraction. But we said, no, 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 this is the person we want, you know. I mean, he's the one who needs this theatre work and he needs process work. And so we did, we included him and with the feedback that came from the children, he realised how much of the cartwheels were actually effective in the play and he himself brought down you know, his indulgence in those cartwheels. So here was an opportunity for his wisdom to kick in. I think we undervalue the wisdom that our children hold and it needs, that needs to be valued. We need to value their questions more than their answers. And so, in fact, uh, this is a drawing that Krishna made and all the kids used to complain about him, saying, you know, during rehearsals he's drawing, because now he had stopped doing the cartwheels, but now he was drawing. And on closer observation, we realized that he was drawing this deity with a little child figure there. And for the first few weeks, both figures had their arms up in defense and almost ready to commit an offense. And slowly over the next couple of weeks, those arms went down in submission, especially of the child figure. And later on, we found that he had drawn the figure with hands in uh, the position of 
being able to give a blessing and uh, make an offering, which was a huge, a huge shift we had seen, which seemed to have come from within. So the points I make in conclusion are these, that we need to redefine schooling. Schools need to become places for sensitivity, uh, because this is where we can have children sharing their vulnerabilities and only then we will see a difference. So what is taboo can be shared. Creativity is intelligence having fun, said Albert Einstein. And when I think of it, you know, it was, it, schools need to become this place for wisdom, wisdom to be shared. So compassion, not just for each other, but for everything, every living being on earth. I think we need to sensitize ourselves and our children. We need to make that a way of being and to create opportunities for healing, not just uh, through band-aids and quick fixes, but through nurturing nature by delving into least intervention methods of farming, using the arts and crafts to replenish our souls, open-mindedness and open classrooms. I can't say enough about this, but I mean, who, get, who is forced, which adult has to sit in a closed room for the number of hours a day that a student sits? And which adult has to carry the kind of heavy bags the children have to carry? So I'm hoping that there would be some change with that. Osmosis, both experiment, experiential and emotional. I think that is important so that there is not just an exchange of ideas which is happening at a head level, but to actually look at what are our experiences that we can share from our hearts and share with our emotions because only then can you put yourself in my shoes and me in yours and make a difference to our realities. Learning to learn through empathy, understanding, and feedback without grading. I do believe that our schools, especially government schools, can become the meeting ground for theater and process institutions. I believe that holistic education need not be the prerogative of the haves alone, that the have-nots also not only deserve it, but need it far more than anything else, that grading is something that could be detrimental and we need to take a hard look at it. If our children are killing themselves, we need to take it seriously and take a hard look at whether it's required at all. Some of the kids who experienced the program, they, some of them dropped out of school, took up vocational training. Some of them have enrolled and become graduates. Some of them are doing jobs, as you'll see in the next slide also. And Yes, so that's what our kids have done so far, and thank you so much.